really makes you think. What if I'm just words on a page, or frames on a screen, or thoughts in somebody's head? Spooky. I love watching YouTube videos. I feel like I've been overthinking things since the beginning of time, and as I grew older, this tendency shifted towards analyzing media as well. When I found out that there was a whole subculture of the internet dedicated to making entire videos explaining the subtext and messages of the shows I loved, I just began consuming that content non-stop. Now, I also love fiction. You gotta consume fiction to overanalyze it, am I right? If only there was a show out there that could bring those two interests together. A show about analyzing media, but that also had some sort of plot behind it. I wonder if such a thing could exist. Televoid is a web series created by Ian, posted on his YouTube channel Brutal Moose. In this series, we follow the adventures of Ian, a young man sitting in front of an old television set in an otherwise completely dark room. Every now and then, the TV will show him a video, usually of instructional nature, and Ian will spend a few moments reviewing it for us. This premise sounds simple enough and isn't too different from Ian's regular channel content, since he is also known to review videos for his YouTube audience. In Televoid, however, the rules are a bit different. The Ian we see here has no control over what media he is able to review, or even when he gets to do it. He apparently can't leave the void on his own either, since it seems to be infinite. The viewer isn't given much information aside from what is presented directly to them, and even then, when Ian tries to explain what is going on in the first episode, some sort of glitch cuts him off, and we are never given access to those facts. As we have seen, the majority of the videos he watches are instructional ones. Even when he reviews a game show, it has segments consisting of adults explaining to children how the challenges work, and even the players themselves are receiving instructions on how to participate. Ian finds humor in how dated these videos are, and how the same subject can be dealt with in different manners depending on the time period. He sometimes questions the effectiveness of the format in actually making people informed, and is especially critical of instances where the kids are given unclear or insufficient instructions and then are punished for not performing a task successfully. Ah, wrong! I made a mistake already? All we did is touch the body! Alright Sam, I know you mean well, but you didn't say grab a helmet, you clearly said everybody grab a bike, they were just following your directions. Following the rules is a big deal in these videos, and it seems to be a big deal in The Void too. Whenever Ian tries to do something he is not supposed to, The Void either punishes him with a glitch, censors his actions, or brings him terrifying visions. When he tries to prolong the duration of episode 2, for example, the show cuts him off completely, showing that he has no control over his situation and must follow The Void's will if he wants to keep reviewing things. Um, you know, I don't actually know if I'm able to move these things around. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I can't do that. With the progression of the episodes, Ian begins to grow more and more frustrated with his circumstances. Turns out that when we aren't watching, Ian has nothing else to do but wait for us to come back. He becomes wary and stressed out, and his enthusiastic persona from the beginning now welcomes us in an aggressive and uncaring manner. The Void punishes this kind of behavior too, glitching him out until he acts cheerful again. Surviving in this place means adjusting every facet of his personality to suit a position that contradicts his true feelings, all while obeying a set of regulations that he has no control over and that make him absolutely miserable. Ian's frustration reaches a peak at episode 4, a message to no one. He is very sarcastic and dry at first, complaining about the video he is reviewing from the very start, but a glitch quickly fixes that. In this episode, Ian has to review a sponsored film on the concept of listening. The story of said video seems to drag a little at times, showcasing this slightly dysfunctional family where no one truly listens to what the other members are saying. 
However, the dad in the film is also a businessman giving a presentation about listening, in which he is advertising the very instructional video we are watching. In his presentation, he also mentions the family from the video, fully knowing that he is a part of the family himself, constantly shifting between both realities. In the quote-unquote fictional part of the video, one of the members of the family has a pet skunk called Stinky, but he runs away and is presumably chased off-screen by dogs. The film ends with the question of whether he survived or not being left unanswered. This prompts Ian to wonder if the real point of the video wasn't to find answers or a concrete solution, but perhaps it was meant to just get you thinking, to raise questions, discussions, to see things from a different perspective. And with that, he meets Stinky. Apparently, the character was able to escape from the movie completely unharmed, and he comes to bring Ian a message. I'm here to deliver you a very, very important message. Listen up. All right, I'm listening. Shut up, that was the message. Listen, listen closely, very, very closely. With the help of a few glitches, he is able to get his point across even further. Listen to me, Ian, and listen well. Before I escape the evil clutches of Patricia, do you know what I did? I guess you listened. No, you stupid. I reflected on my current situation. You understand? You see, this is the real reason why I love Televoid so much. It is a show about the importance of media analysis. Ian has always been critical of the videos he consumed. Even if a lot of the comments were humorous in nature, he constantly questions both character and structural decisions made in such films, and even thinks of a few ways in which those videos can be improved in order to make their messages more effective. If I had one thing I'd change though, it would be to add more scenes of safety woman saving people, instead of just a few exciting scenes which she then uses to ramble on about semi-related safety tips. You went through the trouble of making this a film, and you took a creative angle with it, so why not show me more? The key is to start applying those same principles when thinking about his surroundings. The videos he consumes can give him enough clues to allow him to escape his situation, if only he could start to question it the same way he does with the films. At face value, those instructional videos could be seen as a tool to teach him the importance of following the rules no matter what, but when he stops to think about them, he sees that there is a lot to be questioned, and that they're even prompting him to do it. Stinky, the messenger, is just a character from a film he watched, but he's also an example of how to escape. If Ian thinks about his situation, he can escape too. Meanwhile, there's the audience. Ian talks to the viewers in a Blue's Clues kind of way, greeting us when we arrive and talking about how great it is to see us again, asking us to join in on his games, chatting with us like we're friends, as far as this sort of interaction can go. We, as the audience, are a character too, in a way. If we want, we can send Ian emails, which he receives through a printer in his living room area. We seem to have more awareness than Ian does. We can watch him through the cameras even though he can't see us, and it is our presence that allows him to watch TV shows. Ian is aware of this disparity, and the more the episodes progress, the angrier he gets that we took this long to come back. You know, I gotta say, I don't appreciate how long it took for you to come back here. Except, we don't actually have that power. We do not control when we visit Ian. I know this because if I had that power, I'd be watching new Televoid episodes non-stop. No, we only watch Ian when the show itself wants us to watch him. We get the added bonus of seeing glimpses of his life when we're not there, but we don't control how much of it we see. Even the angles and the cameras used are out of our reach. There is a bigger force at play, and it isn't us. We are also shown things to which Ian has apparently little to no access. The commercials at the beginning. 
Aesthetically speaking, they provide the show with a television-like feel, as if there's a commercial break that we have to sit through in between episodes. If we look deeper into it, however, we can see that they're giving us even more clues into Ian's situation. Every piece of advertisement is connected to whatever happens in the episode. The very first ad we get, serving as an introduction to the series as a whole, is trying to sell us episodic adventures we can get from a cereal box and view through a special lens. There's 11 adventures in all. You can make a rather direct parallel with the in situation. Different episodes that we can follow through a special screen. We're already starting the series with the notion that the stories being handed to us are a product to be consumed, viewed through a special apparatus. It is also a description of what Ian himself is about to go through, since he is the one who has to watch instructional videos now. Ian's existence is media. To question media is to question his circumstances. The second commercial, on the other hand, brings us these terrifying cat people, I mean these terrifying cat people. This ad corresponds to the episode in which we meet not only Ricky Raccoon, but also Frank the Fox, other examples of person-sized anthropomorphic animals. The cats in the commercial can be quite aggressive, Get, get your paws off my scene. which can be considered a hint of how untrustworthy Ricky seems, or of how rude Frank is going to be later on. Waza! With the third commercial, we have this very intense narration where this guy just can't seem to get enough of Sara Lee's fresh banana cake. I eat a lot of Sara Lee fresh banana cake, a lot of smooth, satisfying Sara Lee fresh banana cake. It doesn't feel all that relevant at first, but it will come back to haunt Ian at the end of the episode, once he starts to meddle with the antenna settings. As for the fourth commercial, we have Newport cigarettes. Now, cigarette commercials aren't a thing you see on TV anymore. The reason for that is that cigarettes are actually terrible for you. But back then, nobody cared. So much so that you could make a commercial like this and get away with it. That only changed when people in the real world stop to think and realize that advertising literal poison on television shouldn't be something we're so keen on, and so the ads were banned. In this particular ad, the characters jump out of the television in order to hand the cigarettes to the viewer. What the TV gives you is bad for you. Except in order to realize it's bad, you need to think about your situation. The cigarette theme is especially relevant here, considering this is the first episode in which we see how badly the Void's glitch has been affecting Ian, and some of the consequences are coughing and chest pain. This is also when Stinky urges Ian to reflect on his current situation, otherwise he will never see that what he is consuming is causing him harm, much like we never would have banned those commercials. On episode 5, the Dairy Queen Fairy takes the children off to ice cream heaven. As an added treat, this commercial starts by telling us to listen. Now listen. Now listen. Now listen. Echoing the themes of last episode's film. The ad's ethereal vibe works as a great introduction to the new environment Ian finds himself in, a white void instead of the black one we've gotten used to. He also seems to be back to his usual cheerful self, apparently free of the glitch's consequences. By the end of the episode, however, we see that he is actually still trapped in his usual dark void, with the cameras defining him as unstable. When he is revived, he immediately falls into despair upon realizing where he is. Death is not a possible escape, and any reality where he can be happy living in the void is nothing but a dream. With episode 6, we have a magic trick, which, much like the stories from the cereal box, must also be acquired by eating a certain product. Although, isn't magic itself 
at least in the sleight of hand manner it's performed here, a bit like breaking the rules? You pretend to be following a very well-defined logic, but it's just for show. Normally, if one were to cut the straw like in the trick, the string would be cut too. But those are not the rules a magician truly follows. They are simply the ones he pretends to follow. If Ian breaks the rules, he is punished. He must do as he is told and follow the Void's instructions. If the Void wishes for him to throw a party, the only thing he can do is throw one. However, even if the Void wants Ian to blindly follow instructions, he just can't help but question them, even if he doesn't realize he's doing it. It comes through in the details, like how he constantly brings attention to the silly choices made in the films he reviews, or how its characters come to him urging him to break free. Even the lessons the videos try to teach him end up pushing him towards a path of rebellion. He is asked to listen over and over again, and if he did so, maybe he would realize what all of our emails are actually trying to say. He is told to be aware, alert, alive, to think about his own situation, to consider his own safety. As the Void asks him to throw a party, Ian is visited by his fairy godmother, a twisted version of yet another character he's encountered in the videos. And although he gets too real at times... Don't be yourself! You're boring, Ian! Nobody likes you, so... Ouch! He urges Ian to follow Frank the Fox into the void, where Ian eventually runs into a door. If Ian hadn't thrown that party, he never would have met Frank again. And if the fairy hadn't broken protocol and told him to follow the guest, he wouldn't have found the door. If he hadn't played by the rules, he wouldn't have found Frank. If he hadn't broken them, he wouldn't get a chance to escape much like a magician pretending to play by the rules until the very last moment. Up to the making of this video, this is as far as the series has gotten us. We don't know what's behind the door, or whether Ian will ever be truly able to escape, or even when the next episode will come out. But even if it turns out to be like a message to no one, leaving us on a cliffhanger where we don't know if the character made it out alive or not, I'm okay with that. Maybe we were never meant to have that kind of answer. But what we were definitely meant to do is ask questions. We, as the viewer, are not unlike Ian. We have no control over when a new episode is going to happen. We know nothing of the void. We cannot change anything about this reality. What we can do is view episodic narratives through a special lens and think about them. Ian has his instructional videos, and any conclusions that we can reach from them are already filtered through his perspective. But through the commercials and even the soundtrack, we have access to media he most likely does not, and we have the privilege of taking them into account even though he can't. Ian's only hope relies in looking at the media he consumes through a questioning lens. Other people's narratives can help him understand his own, and, through that, escape a situation that is harming him. Ian doesn't even look like he's doing it on purpose most of the time, but the fact remains that he has a knack for questioning, and the more he does it, the more he progresses. And we, as an audience, can progress along with him. That is, if we want to take that leap. And I do. I really do. Otherwise, what else is there? Thank you for watching. Well, hello there. It was very nice of you to watch this video. I was sick when I recorded the audio for it, so I apologize if my voice sounds weird. If you have enjoyed the video, you can do those cool things such as liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell, as well as following me on Twitter. Feel free to leave a comment down below, especially if it is about how great Televoid is. 
I have also linked the Televoid series in the description, and you should give it a watch if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye! Alright kids, I want you to deliver this next line like you're trapped in a bunker and you're desperately screaming for help. Fascinating.